Raphael Pankowski is a professor at the Institute of Sociology of Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, Poland. He is a member of the International Association of Genocide Scholars and a co-founder of the Never Again Association. Professor Pankowski looks at the history of Polish Jews and anti-Semitism leading up to the Holocaust and persisting beyond 1945 even as Poland became a country without a Jewish population. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Joanna Mischnik, and I'm a senior fellow at the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. It is my great pleasure to introduce our tonight's speaker, Professor Rafał Pankowski from Warsaw, who will be speaking to us about the subject of antisemitism without Jews, the case, the, uh, the case of contemporary Poland. Professor Rafał Pankowski is a sociologist and political uh, scientist by training, and he works at the Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, where he teaches on antisemitism, xenophobia, and hate speech. He's one of the founders, and he's a current head of a very important organization, Never Again, uh, the East European branch, to monitor anti-Jewish speech, hate speech, racism, and xenophobia. In 2019, Professor Parnkowski was awarded the Paul Ehrlich Gunther Schwering Human Rights Award by the Anti-Defamation League. And that award is uh, uh, given to people who fight antisemitism. So we have a privilege to talk to a scholar who is also an activist. Professor Pankowski, the floor is yours. But it became um, uh, well. It, it 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 became very influential, especially in the field of culture um, and in the field of uh, defining what uh, uh, what Polish uh, identity means, uh, who who belongs to to the national community, who who doesn't. Mm, and I would say that since then, um, since then. Uh, Roman Dmowski's, um, uh, Dmowski's model uh, of, um, uh, of Polish identity, excluding Jews as well as other ethnic and, and, and religious mi minorities, this model has been with us uh, ever since. And for those of you who, who have visited Warsaw, you may, um, you may remember um, symbolically there is a monument to Roman Dmowski uh, in front of one of the government buildings in uh, uh, in Warsaw, uh, that was um, that was constructed some fifteen years ago, uh, and also one of the mm, mm, one of the central sites in in Warsaw, uh, the roundabout uh, not far from the central railway station, is also named after uh, after uh, Roman Dmowski. And uh, just preparing for uh, for our um, Conversation. I thought I could even show you uh, the, the the contemporary Polish passport uh, uh, that has a picture of Roman Dmowski uh, among some other uh, Polish uh, um, uh, historical figures. Uh, but unfortunately, in my passport there is a there is a stamp of Malaysia immigration on on his uh, on his forehead, so uh, I cannot really show it. Uh, but uh, um, but okay, this is just one of many examples. Uh, uh, showing uh, how important uh, uh, Roman Dmowski is in Poland, even now, um, um, even now, and let me, let me uh, repeat, he is the founding father of exclusionary um, um, national, nationalism, uh, which, uh, uh, which has also been very, uh, very strong anti-Semitic, and we can therefore call, call Dmowski um, a, a founding father of modern uh, anti-Semitism in Poland. Um, another phrase that that we uh, uh, that we need to to note is the slogan "Polska dla Polaków," Poland for the Polish, where once again the um, 
the subtle or not so subtle message uh, is that only those who are quote unquote truly Polish belong to the uh, to the national uh, community. And this is a slogan that was, that was very prominent in the 1920s, the 1930s in Poland. And the uh, Jews were among the main, um, the main targets uh, of, um, uh, of, that, um, of that slogan. And it is again, not a coincidence that uh, today, uh, uh, the, the big annual march um, organized uh, by, uh, by, by far-right groups in Poland uh, on the 11th of November, the Polish uh, Independence Day, um, uh, often features the slogan Poland for the Polish. Um, and it is not a coincidence that, that this big march um, is, is initiated, co-organized uh, by two um, radical political groups, um, the National Radical Camp, Obus Narodowy Radykalny and the All Polish Youth, Młodzież Wszechpolska. Um, both these groups take their names, uh, their symbolism, and of course their, their ideas directly uh, from the groups that existed under the same names, the same labels uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s. So this element of continuity um, is, is, I believe, very important uh, when we talk about modern radical nationalism, and that includes uh, uh, modern antisemitism uh, as a part of, um, of the political landscape uh, in, um, in, in Poland. Um, so today is the 9th of November. The, the march will probably uh, be very, very large again uh, this year. Over the years, well, it started as a small event in um, uh, 2009, uh, but it grew and uh, uh, eventually it became, I believe, the largest far right um, extremist um, gathering anywhere, bringing together not just Polish groups, but also, um, also uh, various uh, um, neo-fascist, uh, racist and uh, and other extreme right groups from uh, from all over Europe uh, and beyond. But of course, it would be it would be wrong to uh, uh, to jump directly from the 1920s and the 1930s to um, to the 21st century uh, without noting the most dramatic event in the history of the. Uh, of the Jewish community in Poland, of course, uh, of course, the Holocaust, and I don't want to uh, discuss discuss it in detail. Uh, in the, 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 the important uh, the important debates about the um, the role of collaborators, the anti-Jewish violence, uh, um, also the pogroms um, uh, committed during and after World War II by the by the Polish neighbors of the. Um, um, of the Polish Jews, uh, of course, uh, Jan Gross has and others uh, have have uh, have written very uh, very important uh, uh, books on that. Uh, but let me just mention um, uh, the term introduced by Michael Shafir, um, the late Michael Shafir, deflective negationism, uh, which I think is. Uh, is a good term uh, to employ uh, when describing a, 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 an important uh, uh, aspect uh, of the um, of the legacy uh, or awareness or lack of awareness uh, of what uh, what happened to the Polish Jews during World War II. Um, also, the, the, the communist regime in Poland uh, repeatedly uh, mm, sought legitimacy through, through appealing to ethno-nationalist rhetoric. And, um, and of course, uh, the, the communist regime in Poland uh, reached the peak of, uh, uh, of anti-Semitic uh, a, a rhetoric and policy in uh, 19, 1968 
uh, when it conducted uh, its own mm, anti-Semitic campaign that resulted in um, in the in another wave of emigration of Jews in Poland. And, and since then, uh, uh, the Jewish community in Poland has been has been uh, very very uh, tiny indeed. Uh, and anti-Semitism anti-Semitism without Jews the uh, the 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 phrase that that we used as the uh, as the title uh, for um, uh, for our conversation today. Uh, well, I believe that was uh, that was uh, first used, or at least uh, um, it was uh, uh, popularized uh, by uh, Paul Landwey, uh, who wrote an important uh, book on uh, antisemitism in Central Europe in the in the early seventies. Uh, and of course, it is an exaggeration because. Uh, uh, because Jews exist, the, the community may be very small, um, um, but it exists. Um, today, there are different estimates. Um, I would say between 10 and 20,000 people. This, this, these are the most common, common estimates for the size of the, uh, of the Jewish community in Poland. And of course, for, for a country of um, almost 40 million people, this is a very small uh, minority indeed. Uh, but what the, what the phrase, of course, tells us too is, um, is, is the fact that the level of antisemitism, uh, which is rooted in, 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 in prejudice, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is high out of all proportion to the very, very small size of the, uh, of the, of the minority. Uh, and it, it just represents something else. It also represents a more general hostility to to democracy and, and modernity, especially after the uh, the, the the changes, the, the, the social, political, uh, cultural, and economic changes after uh, after 1989. Uh, well, since 2015, we have often heard um, a, another phrase which is very similar mm, mm, namely islamophobia without muslims and i think there are good reasons to uh, to use that phrase when when talking about poland as well because uh, well the muslim community in, in in poland has a long history but it is also very small um but the level of hostility against muslims in poland since especially uh, 2015 um uh, Mm, has been um, um, has been very high, and that was related um, um, first of all to the European refugee crisis, so-called European refugee crisis, that was portrayed in a very in a very uh, negative way in in media in in, in political discourse, um, and it resulted in a in a wave of um, of hostility not just against Muslims. But but against various uh, various uh, uh, minority groups as as well as refugees and migrants, uh, but after twenty fifteen we often heard um, comments um, claiming that from now on Islamophobia uh, replaces antisemitism. As the most common uh, form of um, of hatred, of, of, of hateful discourse, um, and to be honest, I was never convinced that was that was the case. Um, at that time, I thought it might be better to um, to formulate. To formulate um, to formulate that that comment in a different way, to frame it a little differently, um, Islamophobia did not replace antisemitism; um, it supplemented it. Uh, and unfortunately, I think I was I was proved right. Uh, relatively soon um, later, namely in. Uh, 2018, uh, when, um, when, uh, when a big controversy erupted around the, the so-called memory law, or the, um, the, to be more precise, the, the, the legislation on 
uh, the, the Institute of National Memory, uh, uh, and of course the most uh, the, the most controversial um, part of that legislation uh, concerns the criminalization uh, of certain statements uh, about uh, the role of Poles uh, in the extermination of Jews during World War II. And uh, you may remember, uh, especially those of you who, who mm, happened to be in Poland at that time, uh, the controversy escalated very, very quickly. Uh, it, it became uh, an international issue, uh, especially after uh, uh, Israeli and, uh, and American uh, diplomats uh, criticized the legislation. Um, after several months, uh, that uh, uh, the most problematic elements of the uh, of the law um, uh, were modified. It was not scrapped completely, contrary to some media reports that you may have uh, that you may have uh, read. Um, but I think what was most problematic about what happened then was not so much uh, the actual contents uh, of that um, um, of that particular law, but uh, but the the the, um, the discourse that went with it in the public uh, in the public space, uh, including in the biggest media, especially those controlled by the by the state, uh, and that also included uh, statements made by uh, mainstream politicians, including members of the of the ruling party. And I believe that uh, in in a way, 2018 was the um, was the watershed year in terms of mainstreaming uh, anti-Semitism, sometimes in a, in a very crude form. Um, I believe since since then it is impossible to claim that anti-Semitism is 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 a marginal issue in, uh, uh, in 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 Polish politics and society, um, because what happened in 2018, um, I believe in some in some ways is still with us. So the repercussions of this massive wave of uh, of anti-Semitism in Polish media and politics, they are not going to disappear anytime soon. Uh, even if today anti-Semitism is not present uh, in media and politics on a daily basis, um, the repercussions of, of that wave of anti-Semitic discourse um, are, are going to, uh, to, to stay with us uh, for probably for years to come. Um, but then another important moment was the uh, year, in, it was the year uh, 2020. Uh, so already during the pandemic, when the presidential campaign um, focused uh, very much on, um, uh, on the issue of the so-called Jewish claims. This is another Polish phrase, Roszczenia Żydowskie. This is another Polish phrase that, that entered uh, the mainstream uh, mm, and uh, the presidential campaign of that year, in particular, uh, very much focused on uh, on this issue, the issue of uh, uh, imagined um, the imagined threat um, of um, a, of the so-called Jewish claims to property in Poland in the context of. Um, um, of discussions about uh, um, Holocaust era uh, property restitution. Um, and well, I, I would say um, I would say that was another um, another important moment and another unique moment uh, when uh, anti-Semitism was so central to uh, to a political campaign um, and those those anti-Semitic, um, anti-Semitic uh, mm, 
um, claims, preferences uh, were, were instrumentalized in, in, in a very spectacular way uh, in, the, in the winning campaign uh, that, uh, that brought uh, victory to, uh, to President Duda once more. Um, so now the time is flying, but, but I would like to, uh, uh, to say something about this very dramatic contemporary context of the, of the war in a neighboring country. Um, the, the war has, uh, has had a very big impact on, on, on Poland and on Polish society on many levels in many, in many ways. And of course, one of the ways is the, is the presence of millions of refugees from Ukraine in Poland. Um, in a certain sense, that means that very rapidly over the course of months or even weeks, um, Poland became a multicultural society once again. Um, ironically and, and sadly because of the circumstances, uh, but Poland is no longer uh, a mono-ethnic society in, in, the same, in the same way that, 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 uh, that, that it was after, uh, after 1945. Um, and, uh, mm, well, this is one of the, 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 the important aspects of the, of the current situation, because I think even if there is peace in Ukraine tomorrow, um, I think many of the refugees from Ukraine would, would, would stay in Poland anyway, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and I would say that uh, until now, the, the most common reaction uh, to this huge uh, uh, refugee movement uh, is solidarity with, um, with Ukraine, solidarity with the refugees. Um, which I think is in many ways very impressive, given the scale of the uh, of the challenge. Um, but there is also um, there is also a sort of backlash uh, from uh, well, certainly some groups on the on the extreme right who are already um, um, trying to. Uh, uh, to to instigate to to, to incite a hostility or sometimes even violence uh, against the refugees. And uh, why I'm talking about this in the in in the in the context of antisemitism is because this negative discourse about about Ukraine and and about Ukrainians and about the refugees is very very often. Um, uh, uh, accompanied uh, by uh, by anti-Semitic rhetoric and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, um, and well, that is probably not so surprising given the longevity of um, of anti-Semitic uh, uh, conspiracy theories that we also saw during the pandemic, and of course not just in Poland, uh, but. Um, um, but it comes from from the same uh, political groups on the on the far right, uh, such as uh, uh, Confederacja, so Confederation, uh, uh, which is the the far right political party to the right of the current ruling party, Law and Justice, uh, which is uh, which is represented uh, in the in the parliament uh, by eleven members of parliament. Um, and I think we also witness the emergence of certain new tropes in anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories, um, uh, especially uh, especially online, uh, uh, together with our colleagues from the uh, Media Diversity Institute in London, we, uh, we participate in the project, uh, the monitoring project uh, under the title Get the Trolls Out, and we, we monitor and document um such uh, such instances i can mention maybe just one uh, of those um, uh, anti-semitic conspiracy theories uh, related directly to the war um, in ukraine um which is um, already 
um, significant. It is, it is already uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly popular. It is the, um, uh, the idea of Niebiańska uh, Jerozolima, um, that is the, the, the Polish phrase, uh, or heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, according to this, uh, um, this anti-Semitic interpretation of the, of the war uh, in Ukraine, um, the war was planned and implemented by, by the Jews, of course, um, with the purpose of um, uh, sending millions of Ukrainian refugees to Poland, uh, who would subsequ subsequently uh, um, uh, dominate Poland and, and, uh, uh, and uh, take power in Poland. Uh, and they would also um, make room in the south of Ukraine for, for the Jews from Israel who would uh, subsequently uh, arrive in Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, and create another Jewish state. Well, I suppose that sounds like rubbish to all of us, uh, um, but uh, like I like I already mentioned, this this anti-Semitic trope is um, is already um, becoming rapidly uh, and widely uh, popular um, um, on social media, but also uh, it has been endorsed and supported uh, by uh, uh, by certain well well known. Um, uh, far-right and anti-Semitic uh, activists, in including members of parliament from the party I mentioned, uh, Confederatio. Um, I expect this kind of discourse to grow in the context of the of the war uh, and the and the crisis uh, that uh, that is at least partly related to to the war in Ukraine. Um, I think there is very broad expectation, and not only in Poland, of, of major uh, social and economic turmoil, uh, which, as we know very, very well from history, provides a certain um, window of opportunity uh, for, uh, for those extreme right groups that, uh, that weaponize uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, and uh, in the in the in the context of Poland, those and uh, those conspiracy theories uh, tend to be uh, tend to uh, to be uh, anti-Semitic. Um, I hope that my expectation or my uh, my anxiety about the new window of opportunity uh, for another wave uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, of uh, anti-Semitic discourse. I hope my expectation is not fulfilled, uh, but I would, I would, I would like to, to, uh, to emphasize that um, um, our organization, Never Again, Never Again Association, is, is already very busy uh, documenting such cases, and uh, we, um, we definitely uh, have a lot of work uh, documenting uh, uh, this type of cases uh, every day. So certainly this is something that is already very real. Uh, this is something that I am afraid can spread further uh, very soon. There is some fertile ground for that. Um, so there is an urgent need of uh, a of um, not just uh, awareness, uh, but also uh, civic intervention. Uh, and this is something that we can discuss further or we can discuss any other, any other issue uh, uh, among the, the, the things that I mentioned and or of course many things that I, that I didn't mention. So I would, I, would be, uh, I would be very happy to hear your uh, questions or, or comments or, or opinions. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, Rafael, thank you very much for this thoughtful talk. I mean, you have 
you cover many aspects of anti-Semitism uh, in Poland today, anti-Jewish tropes uh, in the past, uh, the anti-Jewish tr uh, traditions and how they unfold today and the expansions of these traditions. So I would like to open the floor uh, for discussions and uh, given the fact that this talk is on Zoom, you can either write your question or comments in the chat or you can raise a hand and I will try to make sure that I will call you, uh, uh, call, uh, see you and call your name. Uh, we are on two pages. So at present, I see one raise hand. Uh, I don't know the name of the person, but I'm actually, uh, we'll try to un unmute the person, uh, the gentleman. I can't see anyone with a raised hand, sorry. Okay, no. yeah. you I just unmuted me, yes, thank you. So- um I saw you quite yes, quickly. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. Thank you very much. Um, so, Professor uh, Pankowski, thank you for your mm, very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Henrik Baran, by the way. Um, I, have, I have two quick questions. Um, the first one, to what extent the current is the current anti-Semitic um, discourse connected to the anti-German discourse, which um, is playing such a major role in current po Polish political um, life. Uh, and the second one, um, I had not heard about the, the concept of the uh, heavenly Jerusalem connected with Ukraine. Um, and I'm wondering, does it, is it, um, in some way connected to the term Nibiesnaya Sotnia, which of course was applied to those who perished um, in the revolution in Kiev. Um, any comments would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think both these questions are, um, are, are interesting. Um, Mm, let me start from the second one because that that is maybe uh, maybe easier for me. The, the, my honest answer is I'm not sure. I don't really know for sure. I've been trying to uh, find more information about the genesis of this conspiracy theory, and of course, uh, it sort of um, uses the the, the sort of long history of. Uh, of, of, of Jewish presence uh, in, in Ukraine, um, but the, the actual origin of the phrase uh, is, is still a little bit un unclear. I had a very interesting conversation about that with uh, Konstante Gebert, uh, uh, who, 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 who is uh, uh, known uh, um, to, um, uh, to, to, to many of you. Um, and I, I think I, th I, th I think we need to 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 do more more research on on, on that, and maybe maybe we will uh, be able to to locate the you know the precise origin of 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 of, of this conspiracy theory, just the way we can more or less locate the origin of the protocols of the elders of Zion. But I think that 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 would take some time, and maybe maybe that's not even the most important thing. Uh, 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 what is what I think is, is is very important now is to document the spread of this uh, of this theory at the same time as uh, as trying to uh, to to, um, to find out its, um, its its specific source um the 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 other question is um mm. is complex um well first of all um the movement of roman Dmowski, uh, I already talked about uh, uh, was simultaneously anti-Jewish and anti-German. So once again, there is a long history. There is uh, there is a long tradition 
uh, of the um, of the of, of the nationalist movement in Poland being both um, anti-Semitic and anti-German. Um, also, the, um, the communist um, period offers example of um, of this course that was simultaneously anti-Israeli and uh, an anti-German or anti-West German, if you like, uh, uh, which I think is uh, uh, is very often um, mm, is very often recycled uh, in Poland today. Like you said, and I I, I completely agree with you that uh, some of the um, mm, some some of the tropes uh, that that we see in uh, in, in, in 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 Poland today uh, are simultaneously anti uh, anti German and uh, uh, and anti Semitic, alluding to a supposed collusion between Jews and Germans against Poland uh, on issues of history, on issues such as um, uh, reparations or property restitution. Uh, and so on. Um, so I would say, I would say yes. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, quite often, those uh, uh, um, those uh, um, discursive tropes uh, uh, go together, and uh, perhaps it is a, a peculiar um, aspect of the, um, uh, or one of the peculiar aspects of uh, of anti-Semitic discourse in Poland today. Thank you, Rafał, for answering those questions. Since I don't see any other questions, I have a couple of questions for you. And I'm, I will be asking you these questions, not only in the capacity of the house, the chair of this meeting, but also the scholar of uh, antisemitism in Poland. And uh, I would like to start with a uh, the issue of radical political parties. As we know, they grow and spread. Uh, there is proliferation of variety of movements. They split up. And there is a new situation in Poland uh, currently. In the past, let's say at the beginning of the post-communist period, being a member of a radical extreme right-wing party uh, was, uh, was something that you would not necessarily advertise in, the, in society as such. However, today, looking at these demonstrations that you have talked about, and we are about to witness, to see another uh, ra radical right-wing, uh, demonstrations all over Poland, uh, the main ones in Warsaw, but they are taking place in other cities. In, and in these radical demonstrations, ordinary members of society take place, uh, take part, including uh, young families with children. There is a lot of violence associated with those demonstrations. And this is what actually bothers me, I had written about this, because there is that performance of power, uh, anti-Jewish hate covered or overt very often in the slogans. And you have very young people. You also have uh, middle class individuals. You also have uh, uh, people in their 60s and 70s participating in those events. How do you see it? Is it something broken in terms of a code? What is right and what is wrong in Polish society, given that situation? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I certainly agree, agree with you. Uh, the, the social norm has shifted. There, I think there is no doubt about that. The, the social norm has, uh, has shifted. Uh, the, the distinction between um, political, extremism and, and the political mainstream um, has been blurred. Uh, that is, uh, 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 that is uh, very, very true. Uh, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, well, many people for reasons 
that I understand points to the year um, uh, 2015. I also mentioned that important year, uh, but I think it doesn't mean that that everything uh, changed. Uh, mm, that everything changed in in, in 2015. Uh, it was a longer process. There, I would say that, that that was a longer process of erosion of certain uh, uh, norms and values of of, uh, of the political culture, the democratic political culture. Um, that existed before, and uh, and once again, of course, we know this is not just a Polish phenomenon, uh, but I think Poland is is a good example of that. It is it is a good example of that, uh, which is important for for many reasons. But one of the good reasons uh, to look at Poland as uh, as an important case is the fact that Poland used to be, uh, uh, you know, Poland Poland was often presented uh, as, as a model of successful democratic transformation uh, and again not not without not 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 without uh, not, not not without good reasons uh, um, uh, but i think the polish case also shows that the the uh, the democratic culture and, and the, the the progress of democratic transformation cannot be taken for granted it is not a one way street democratization is not a one way street and yes uh, i think in in many ways the, the, the issue of antisemitism is, is, is a part of that. Uh, um, and and the, also the more broader issue of, um, uh, uh, of extreme nationalism uh, or, or, or hatred in, 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 in politics. Um, but um, um, I, think, I think, well, okay, what is, what is maybe, uh, what is important to note is also the, the very, um, um, the very common assumption that I think was very widespread on the part of uh, what we can call the, the liberal elite uh, in the 1990s about democratization being a one way street. Uh, and uh, I think there was also a very, a very common assumption about antisemitism being a kind of leftover from the past, uh, being something that mostly concerned people who may have been you know, born and, and raised uh, uh, before World War II uh, and socialized uh, in a certain way and with a certain baggage of prejudice, well, those people sooner or later will disappear and antisemitism will disappear with them. I, th I think also this assumption in, in included, included the, um, the idea that young people who, uh, who, who, who would be born and raised in a, in a new democratic society, they, they would automatically be more uh, more progressive more open-minded um more tolerant than the generation of their parents and, and and grandparents and i think already in the 90s this assumption was wrong and already in the 90s when we uh, when we started um, the never again association we uh, we challenged that assumption because already then we saw many things on uh, also on the level of the younger generation um, uh, that, um, uh, that 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 were contrary uh, to uh, uh, to that uh, uh, to that problematic uh, assumption. Um, so we saw the emergence of an anti-Semitic culture in uh, in the football stadium. Uh, we saw the the the, the, the emergence of uh, uh, of extreme right uh, political groups uh, uh, active uh, among uh, among the younger generation. Um, uh, and so on. Uh, so, um, um, so once again, I, I, I would repeat: uh, I, um, I agree with you. A, a, a lot has changed, uh, but but that was that was a process that took years. Uh, but of course, in the last years, we see the intensification of the uh, of, of of the phenomenon and. Uh, Yes, once again, this big march in uh, in Warsaw, in particular on on the eleventh of November, uh, is uh, is a good example is a good example of that. Uh, it it includes some of those extreme right uh, groups and, and and activists, but it also you know it also includes other people uh, who apparently see not, nothing wrong with bringing their kids to to a demonstration organized by extremists, which I think is, is very worrying in itself. Uh, right. Absolutely. Um, so I, th I think 
this this really um, this really challenging year uh, 2018 that I mentioned, which was the year of 100 years of Polish independence, the year when the when the wave of antisemitism uh, unfortunately uh, occurred in, in in the first half of of year. Uh, but I think it was also a very a very bad moment uh, when the, when the march uh, in November was joined by the president of Poland, which I would say symbolically legitimized even further uh, the rise of nationalist extremism in, um, in, in, in the country. Thank you. Before I ask you my second question, I have a question for you from Leon Edelman, who is asking the following. What role does the Catholic Church play in spreading antisemitism in Poland? Um, I'm not surprised by this question. I think it is a very legitimate question and I would be surprised if it didn't appear in, um, in our discussion. Um, well, I already alluded to the, the, um, the, the, the phrase Polak Catholic, Polish Catholic, which is one of the most dominant um, interpretations of uh, what it means to be to be Polish, uh, but I would I would stress again. I think in this context, Catholic is not so much uh, an indicator of, of, of a certain belief, but um, um, but uh, uh, it is it, it is a marker of of, of ethnicity. Um, um, when it comes to the church, and of course, there's you know there is there, there is a long history of uh, uh, of antisemitism in in, in 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 the Catholic Church, but I think in the in again in the 1990s in Poland, um, there were many positive initiatives from the church or within the church on on Christian Jewish dialogue or Catholic Jewish relations. Um, and I think in at that time we could still debate which uh, which of the uh, movements, groups, initiatives within the Catholic Church in Poland, um, which one is more representative? Would it be, for example, Tygodnik Powszechny, a very you know respected intellectual publication uh, uh, with a very mm, positive attitude to um, to all things Jewish? Uh, or would it be Radio Maria, which is um, um, which is um, which is the opposite of of, of the Godin for which uh, which is not just a radio station, uh, uh, but it is a, a, a sort of social movement, uh, um, uh, which is uh, Catholic as well as xenophobic and uh, and often anti-Semitic. Um, and uh, I would say, unfortunately, today um, it is more and more clear to me that you know Radio Maria uh, has won this uh, this uh, um, uh, this debate uh, within uh, within the Catholic Church in Poland, and I think especially since the uh, the death of John Paul II, uh, the, the 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 sort of xenophobic wing of the Catholic Church in Poland has been. Uh, has been gaining uh, uh, more and more influence. Um, well, you could say the church as a whole uh, has uh, uh, has been shrinking in terms of its uh, influence in Polish society, especially among among um, among young people. Um, uh, but uh, but in terms of the sort of power struggle within the church in Poland, I, I would say that the xenophobic wing wing is uh, is is, is defin definitely definitely stronger and that often means uh, um, that often means uh, um, expressions of um, of antisemitism and what what has happened to the catholic university of lublin i think is one one big example of that uh, the university that for decades uh, um, could be proud of its um, uh, of its academic standing as, as as well as a certain spirit of tolerance Today is one of the hotbeds of uh, of uh, of far right as well as anti-Semitic activity, and I can give specific examples of the way that the Catholic University of Lublin, for example, has publicly officially legitimized blood libel, which we thought was uh, 
a thing of the past in the in the in the in the Catholic Church in the 20th century. Um, so um, so I, I would say my assessment of the um, of the position of the of the of the Catholic Church in Poland vis-a-vis -vis antisemitism is not uh, is not a very positive one. Of course, we could still find good people within the church who who, who have goodwill when it when it comes to uh, to confronting uh, uh, antisemitism. Uh, but I'm afraid uh, they may not have the 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 the, the, the kind of uh, um, the kind of standing that they deserve. Legitimization of the blind libel, I think, is one of the most disturbing phenomena. And of course, we are talking also about education. And I think one of the lectures uh, that talk about blind libel as a historical fact uh, was available for a very long time on a YouTube run by the Catholic uh, University in Lublin. Uh, but I have another question on another topic, different topic. Uh, how would you assess the role of anti-Zionism in Poland's politic, politics amongst political parties? That's a question from Laura Love. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the, the anti-Semitic campaign of 1968 uh, uh, is, is also referred to as um, um, as the anti-Zionist campaign, um, uh, but if we, because it was it was um, sort of expressed through uh, uh, through, through anti-Zionist uh, language, but if we if we talk about more uh, more, more recent uh, more recent period, um, I think from time to time we heard that okay the polish right may be uh, maybe often anti-semitic uh, but at least they support israel on the on on, on uh, in the in the field of international uh, relations I, I think that was a certain there was a certain cynical assessment uh, of uh, of those two you know two levels of analysis uh, and I think that really changed in uh, in uh, in 2018, uh, when the wave of antisemitism, um, the, the antisemitic uh, uh, statements related to to, um, to Polish history and 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 the, and, the, and the history of, uh, of World War II and and the Holocaust, um, that went together with with a wave of very aggressive uh, uh, um, and very negative language about Israel. Um, so I think I think now I would I would I would say that uh, uh, this distinction is no longer valid. Uh, the distinction between you, you know uh, expressions of anti-Semitism for the domestic market. Uh, as somehow offset by by the by the support for, for the state of Israel on on the international level, I think that no longer applies as a, as a very sort of clear cut distinction, and uh, I and I think since twenty eighteen, uh, the hostility um, against Israel as such has also been very uh, often uh, expressed in in very spectacular ways. Um, in uh, in Polish media and, 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 and politics, including including the media owned by the state and uh, and and including uh, members of the uh, of the ruling party. Thank you, uh, Rafael, for this. Actually, the anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli uh, rhetoric was present at the commemorations of the Yedvabne event two years ago uh, and three years ago in, in Yedvabne. And this uh, right-wing organizations went uh, there to accuse those who wanted to commemorate the Jewish victims of the Yedvabne program of uh, representing uh, people who have inflicted 
much more harm to other people than the Poles did to the Jews. And this brings me to another question that I actually wanted to ask you. Uh, is you have mentioned the Edvatna debate, you have mentioned the discourse, and what we see here with the discourse about Edvatna and the new wave of uh, press, books, uh, articles questioning the fundings of Jan Gross and others, uh, uh, what we see in this material is underlying anti-Jewish uh, propaganda. And once again, the Jews are the ones who have harmed the Poles. And in the fact that they are actually producing now works that question the myth of the noble um, Poland and solely noble Poland, the Poland of victims and heroes only confirms the fact that the Jews are the key enemies of Poland. And of course, this also goes beyond uh, that and spreads to the utilization of secondary literature about the Holocaust from the West, from the West and using, utilizing this literature, authors uh, such as key scholars of the Holocaust, David Engels and other, to claim actually that the Jews uh, inflicted upon themselves uh, discrimination and persecutions in the ghettos. Eva Kurek, I think, is one of the uh, key examples of that propaganda. So I would like to uh, hear from you some of your thoughts on this very troubling topic because deals with the memorializations of the Holocaust and and with the creation of anti-memorialization of the Holocaust filled with anti-Semitic tropes at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think this 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 term um, anti-memorialization is, is is a very is a very interesting one. Uh, and, and very relevant. Um, I, I think we could also call it, sometimes we can call it pseudo-memorialization uh, or, or manipulative memorialization, uh, which, uh, uh, um, which, uh, which is all about instrumentalizing uh, um, history. And uh, Poland is one of the rare countries um, uh, where history can be front page news. Uh, uh, historical debates are still very important in Poland, uh, uh, in, 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 in Polish politics, in, 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 in Polish society, well, for a lot of reasons uh, uh, that, that go beyond the, 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 the history of, um, of anti-Semitism. Um, but it is also one of the important, uh, uh, one of the important topics. Um, and um, I think in this context, it is very difficult um, to, uh, um, to overestimate the role of one institution in particular, uh, namely um, IPN, the, the Institute of National Memory. Uh, the, uh, with, um, with a lot of funding, to be sure, um, and uh, with, with a lot of power and a lot of influence uh, on, on, on different levels of, uh, of, of, Polish, uh, um, of Polish government administration and, uh, and, and society, and that includes the educational system uh, uh, and, uh, and many other things. And um, unfortunately, this institution that could be a very, um, a very um, positive actor, um, when it comes to dealing with the past, when it comes to um, um, dealing with, with with commemoration in a in a dignified and and and, and, and in, um, uh, in constructive way, um, well, this this very institution uh, in in the in the in the last years has uh, has become a tool of the of the far right nationalist agenda of. Uh, 
uh, of instrumentalized history. Uh, mm, and yes, we can give a long list of, of examples of, uh, mm, of, uh, of, of problems of, uh, of manipulating the, 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 the history of the Holocaust, the, the, the stories of the, uh, of the righteous, uh, the, the, uh, the, the facts of uh, um, related to uh, well, for example, the, the 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 Jewish police in the ghetto, and so on, and so on. Uh, um, uh, all 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 those elements combined um, uh, often amount to to portraying Jews in and the victims of the Holocaust in the bad light, and um, and the ethnic poles in 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 a good light. Um, and um, um, well, there are also well known cases of. Uh, um, of uh, far right, of known far right extremists uh, being nominated to high level position with, 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 within the Institute of, uh, um, of, 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 of National Memory. Um, I would say it's also not a coincidence that, for example, a, a long time head of publishing uh, of the publishing uh, part of, of the Institute is. Uh, um, um, has, has a record of publishing uh, Holocaust revisionist uh, uh, material, uh, including David Irving's books in, in, the, in the Polish translation. Um, so I think this is one of the most important, uh, not the only one, but one of the one of the most important uh, fronts in the uh, well, in what we can call struggle against antisemitism in Poland. Uh, it is the uh, uh, the the front of history and memory, uh, and in the, in this context, the Institute of National Memory is one of the most problematic, uh, one of the most problematic institutions, uh, one of the most problematic actors. Not the only one. There are well, there are also big discussions uh, around the Pilecki Institute and and and, and other similar um, um, institutions uh, uh, sponsored by by the government. Uh, but certainly the Institute of, Institute of National Memory is the uh, is the most powerful one. Rafał, I cannot agree with you more. Uh, just to explain to some of our listeners, the Institute Pilecki Institute that you just mentioned is an offspring of the Institute of National Memory. Uh, set up in 2017, and it uh, not only works in Poland within the country, but it has its branches in different countries, in different capitals all over Europe. Uh, and the Berlin branch, for example, is one of the most active one. But going back to the questions about anti-Zionist rhetoric in current politics, I have a follow-up questions by Henrik Barron. Uh, he's asking you, does the Polish government continue to support Israel in the UN? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure this, this remark is... Um, um... Is, is is correct in the sense that uh, I'm sure there are votes in the UN where uh, where, where, where the Polish government still votes uh, in favor of Israel, uh, but I think that that can no longer be taken for granted um, the way I think it was often taken for granted until 2018. So since then, for sure, the interstate relations have been very strained and very very tense. Uh, and uh, it is just not the same. It is not the way the relationship was. Also, between uh, mm, mm, well, between the Polish leaders and uh, and 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 the, the, and the Israeli leaders. Um, and of of course, there is another uh, there there is another player here, which is the U.S. Um, and uh, the the Polish right has been very uh, very strongly linked uh, politically uh, to the Trump camp. Uh, but as we all know, the Trump period in the US has al also meant in, in, in many cases, uh, well, instrumentalization of the, uh, of, 
of, of, uh, of the Jewish community and, and the issues in the Middle East that we don't really need to discuss, uh, that, that we don't need to discuss here, but we also know that that there have been expressions of anti-Semitism on, 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 the, on the right in the US that also have, um, have been considered um, a form of encouragement for, uh, or, or a form of legitimizing anti-Semitism more globally and also, also in Poland. But of course, this is a slightly different, different topic, not, uh, not our main topic for today, I understand. Thank you. I think the latest news from the United States might be that Donald Trump uh, be losing uh, uh, advocates. Uh, but I want to finish on another note. Uh, you have mentioned uh, the Russian war against Ukrainians and the rise of new anti-Semitic tropes as a result of having a large Ukrainian uh, group of refugees in Poland. We know that seven and a half million Ukrainians enter Poland. I think 25% of that number I think has been living in Poland since the outbreak of the war. Uh, and in my view, these new traps are old one in the new battles because they basically reinforce the myth of the Jew as Poland's threatening other on an internet on all scale, the, as well as on a global international scale. And here the aspect of international scale is being brought into, uh, into to explain that the Jews are in fact behind this, this war. Yes? And as a result, it is us, the Poles, who suffer because the Ukrainians are taking our jobs, et cetera, et cetera, taking yes, our space in, Ukrainian children are taking space in Polish schools. Uh, but in some ways, this is still the old structure, the, uh, the old frame or the matrix of, anti of, of uh, the right-wing antisemitism that makes the Jews in the center of all the uh, disasters that befalls Poland. Do you see that this way? Uh, well, thank, thank you. That is, uh, I, I, think, I think this is a very interesting comment. And obviously I, I, I agree with you. Um, I would maybe add one more aspect that is, that is related, I, I, I believe. Um, so one of the big challenges of, uh, of one of many big challenges of the of the refugee situation in Poland today is the is the challenge of diversity. And uh, of course, I think I I already mentioned it. It's never been true that, that Poland was one hundred percent ethnic Polish after nineteen forty five, but it was almost uh, historically Poland. Of course, used to be one of the most diverse societies in, in, in the whole of Europe. Uh, but uh, after 1945, it was one of the um, one of the most monocultural, monoethnic societies in, in, in the whole of Europe. So this issue of uh, diversity uh, uh, and homogeneity uh, is, uh, or, or the choice, if you like, the dilemma uh, uh, between, between uh, um, diversity and, and homogeneity, the, the tension uh, is, uh, is, is, is a serious one. And well, frankly speaking, you know, most Polish people have very, very little experience of living in a, in a, in a diverse multicultural uh, society. Uh, and the very, um, uh, you know, the very moment of confrontation with, with diversity um, brings challenges. Um, 
and of course, historically, as we know, uh, um, the other uh, in, in, in Polish culture has, uh, has often or, or usually been the Jew. Uh, now, well, now it, 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 it may be the Ukrainian, but, 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 but it may be the Ukrainian refugee, but the conflation of, uh, of, of the Jew and, and the refugee and the, the Ukrainian uh, is, um, I, I think, in some ways, um, is, 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 a, is a reaction to the challenge of diversity. And I think this is, uh, in, uh, in some ways, where those conspiracy theories come from. Uh, the, the, they come from from the shock of the war, the the, the shock of being confronted with uh, with millions of of, of refugees. Uh, um, but also, um, this is one way of making sense of of, of reality, uh, which is uh, uh, which is very difficult to make sense of. Um, and again, I I I, I, I guess. This is nothing new because historically anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theory has been a way of making sense of reality that that, that, that was difficult to understand that was, that was complex uh, that was uh, that was challenging uh, and I think in 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 a way this is a similar challenge but uh, uh, but on a huge scale and of course under very dramatic and, and tragic circumstances. Thank you for this actually this. Uh, shows us that in many ways the anti-Semitic tropes today have the same non-rational base and fear is one of the driving forces behind the rise of anti-Semitism and incorporation of this anti-Semitic myths, old anti-Semitic myths into the explanations of current problems that Poles have to deal with. I don't see any other question, so I would like to thank you, Rafael, for this thoughtful lecture, um, troubling intellectually and morally topic. I'm sure that we'll be meeting you at different capacity is soon. But before we end the Zoom, I would like to remind uh, our audience that our seminar series is run in collaboration with the Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism and Indiana University. And our next lecture will be given on 13 November next very soon. And our speaker on that day will be Francisca Hauk, who will be talking on a different subject, but very topical one, to the functions of antisemitism in queer feminist discourse. So I look forward, we all look forward to seeing you at this talk and future talks and we look forward to hosting Rafa you at another event once again thank you for all your reflections and fascinating discussion that is my pleasure thank you very much <laughs>